Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this was supposed to be Lisa's debut on TV, but if you saw Channel 17 last week, <laughs> the Age of Innocence book discussion with Susan R. Better, Lisa was on, so they got her first. But um, before we start, uh, uh, one quick thing. One of our, we're having um, a lot of programs next month, and there's flyers in the back, but I would just want you to, to think about coming to one of them particularly, because we don't usually do poetry here, but um, Jay Rogoff is going to be here on Tuesday, May 6th. He's going to talk about poetry, his poems, and he's been here before on a lot of different topics, but he's a really good, good guy. Even if you don't like poetry, you'll love Jay, so please try to come to that, because it'll be really good. So here's Lisa to tell us about this book. She's already told me to tell you that today's book review is going to be rated PG-13. <laughs> Bordering on R, I think she said. Bordering on R. Really interesting book. The book is called Girls Gone Mild, Young Woman Reclaims Self-Respect and Find It's Not Bad to Be Good by Wendy Shallot. And um, if you don't know what Girls Gone Mild is a play on, Lisa will explain that. I'll so. Explain. Here, so here's Lisa with Kyle's kid. Tell us about this book. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, just a quick survey. How many people have read uh, Return to Modesty, which came out in 99? Okay, and how many have had a chance to read this one, which came out last year? Okay, um, just a little recap. Uh, Return to Modesty came out in 1999. Uh, Wendy Shalit, I've heard her name pronounced Shalit and Shallot, so I'll go with Shalit just to be different from Joe <laughs> and contrary. Uh, she was 23 at the time and had graduated from Williams College over in the Berkshires. Um, she had a Jewish upbringing, not particularly orthodox. Uh, I believe her father was a faculty member at the University of Chicago. Um, when she went to Williams, her concerns were that things like co-ed dorms, co-ed bathrooms, in an effort to equalize the sexes and empower women, were actually making them feel exceedingly uncomfortable. Uh, when Wendy was in fourth grade at an elementary school in the Chicago area, she, her parents withdrew her from the school sex education class, not because they didn't want her learning about sex or even learning about it at that particular age. What they wanted was to teach her themselves and show that sex was something that went hand in hand with a committed relationship and respect between the man and the woman. And they didn't feel that she would be getting that uh, in, the, in the school setting. They, feel that, they felt that she'd be getting a much more clinical take on it, um, one where it's sort of uh, treated like fruit flies. So um, when, let me just fast forward here. Um, when the book came out in 99, uh, it received good reviews from critics um, for its structure, the ideas that it brought up, but it created a bit of a firestorm. Um, feminist leaders, you would think, um, since they're saying the idea of the feminist movement is so that we can all achieve our own dreams and be what we want to be, this didn't fit with their agenda at the time. Kathy, uh, Katha Pollitt, who's a faculty member and feminist writer, uh, called Shalit a twit. Gloria Steinem, famous feminist leader said that she wasn't about to take advice on how to live her life from a virgin. And the New York Observer ran a cartoon of Wendy Shalit as a jackbooted Nazi. Um, Shalit kept saying, this is really not what I'm going for with this book. Um, I'm, I'm not creating a neo-Victorian manifesto. I'm simply asking girls and women to listen to their inner voices, that if they are uncomfortable with co-ed dorms, with co-ed bathrooms, they should say so and ask administrators to perhaps change things on campus. If they are unhappy with current dating traditions um, and multiple sex, sex partners, they should say that. Um, Interestingly, because of all the controversy, it's spawned a lot of new books on this subject. Some other titles by other authors are The Thrill of the Chaste, Finding Fulfillment While Keeping Your Clothes On, Prude, How the Sex-Obsessed Culture Damages Girls and America Too, and also Unhooked, How Young Women Pursue Sex, Delay Love, and Lose at Both. Has anyone had a chance to read Tom Wolfe's last novel, I Am Charlotte Simmons? Um, 
This is basically a fiction work which is loosely based, people say, on Duke University. He calls it DuPont University in the novel. And it's about a girl who comes, I think, from the hill towns of West Virginia and is academically brilliant, receives a full scholarship to Duke University, and which she gets there, instead of receiving an education, she enters into basically a bacchanal and is incredibly shocked at what she finds there, that she feels her fellow students are not there to engage their minds and learn about their subjects, but simply to have, have a wild time. <laughs> So here we go, fast forwarding to 2007, Girls Gone Mild, Young Women Reclaim Self-Respect and Find It's Bad to Be, It's Not Bad to Be Good. Uh, Wendy Shalit is now married. She is living in Toronto with her husband and young son. Um, the fact that she's published two books by her early 30s is making me feel pretty depressed. Um, has anyone heard uh, the title, Girls Gone Mild? is a play on Girls Gone Wild videos. Has anyone seen those or heard of them? OK. Um, hope. Uh, the Girls Gone Wild videos are taken at spring break locations like Cancun and various places in Florida, um, Bourbon Street also, where young women have been drinking mass quantities of alcohol. And I'm not talking two or three fruity drinks with the umbrellas in them. I am talking lots and lots of beer to the point where they really can't be responsible for their behavior. And they're filmed taking their clothes off, participating in wet t-shirt contests. And the big trend now is girl on girl kissing. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of criticism for this because uh, Apparently, there are many critics who feel that these girls are being plied with alcohol to the point they, they simply can't be responsible for their behavior. Um, the girls do sign releases at some point in the evening, but again, you know, that's something you do when you're really not responsible for your actions. Uh, there are some feminist leaders who say that um, engaging in such a free-spirited romp is actually empowering, that it's helping women be friendly with their bodies, uh, to say that everything underneath my clothes is okay. But I, what Wendy Shalit and others of um, her mindset are saying that what these producers are doing is taking incredible advantage of these young girls. Uh, this, the newer book, more than the others, is aimed at society as a whole. Um, it talks about girls, young unmarried women, and mothers of young girls, and what we're doing in our society uh, to raise them and inculcate them with, diff with views about their own sexuality, their relationship with boys and men, and what their role in society is. Um, her point uh, is that young women and young men right now are probably getting a little tired of all the hanky-panky about the power struggle, about the utter lack of rules regarding dating, and are ready for some kind of decency, some kind of boundaries. Uh, let's see, romance, love, sex, and dating with a little bit on attire thrown in. I'm sure back in the 1920s, grandmothers of young girls were absolutely appalled that the girls were rolling their stockings, raising their hemlines to one inch above the knee, and getting their long hair bobs. Um, also, we had the braless look in the 70s. Um, the idea behind that is, and keep in mind that bras back then were built much more constrictively than they are today, that women should shed the girdles, shed the bras, um, be free with what Mother Nature gave them. Uh, for an example, look at Faye Dunaway in the movie Network. Um, what most women found after a while is that going braless for more than a couple hours is actually kind of uncomfortable. So dressing in a shocking fashion is nothing new. This has been going on forever. And as far as um, shocking the establishment, there are quotes that you can find taken from ancient Greek times where uh, the elders were saying that young people had no respect anymore, that the relations that they were having with the opposite sex as young people were absolutely appalling. So this is, this is really nothing new. Um, one of my concerns with this book is Wendy Shalit, I think, is taking the absolute most appalling examples in American society and using it to illustrate her point. I mean, obviously, you feel strongly about a point you have to make. Um, 
you're going to get the most shocking examples to back you up. A lot of her evidence, however, is anecdotal and not based on studies. She has a couple websites called the Modesty Zone and Modestly Yours, and she's taking quotes from girls who write in and say they're very unhappy, very uncomfortable with how things are set up at their high school or college. They don't know what to do. They feel like the only ones who don't want to wear belly shirts and low rider jeans. So I'm thinking that a little more scientific study, a little more sociological uh, hard evidence to back up her point would be helpful. Um, her thesis is that baby boomer feminists, or what she calls third wave feminists, took the worst of male behavior, um, aggression in social and business settings, tomcat sexuality, and told young women that this is the new model for behavior. In other words, let's beat them at their own game. Shalit is saying, why don't we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, she's saying, yes, by all means, let men and women be equal, but do we have to take the worst behavior and let that set the bar for everybody? Um, another one of her concerns, and I certainly, as a mother of a young daughter, agree with her on this, is that she said messages regarding sexuality are being aimed at younger and younger girls. Um, when we talked about bobbing hair and raising one's hemlines, that was usually among women who were grown um, in their late teens, early 20s, who were done with their education, who were ready to be married and out on the dating scene on their own. And now we're looking at um, children in elementary school who are getting messages about sexuality younger and younger. Uh, one of her favorite examples is the Bratz doll. I don't know if you've seen these. I'll pass this around. <coughs> now, I'm not saying Barbie was an incredible role model with her pneumatic breasts and her 18-inch waist. In fact, um, I believe some physiologists had done a study on Barbie and said if she were an actual person because of her leg length, um, her wide shoulders, her large bust, she would simply be unable to walk. But at least Barbie's an astronaut and a doctor now. Um, these girls look ready to walk the streets at night. Um, this particular model of Bratz doll, as you'll see on the package, is aimed at age six and up. There are other Bratz dolls that are aimed at four and up. So we're talking about preschool aged girls. And these are obviously heavily sexualized young ladies. Um, I don't really need to explain any more about uh, Paris Hilton, about Britney Spears. These, these um, young women who I think are famous simply for being famous uh, are not fringe entertainers. They are mainstream. Um, I continue to be shocked at the fact that their escapades are showing up on programs like MSNBC and CNN. They're out of entertainment tonight. This, we, are, we are into mainstream news now. So um, co-ed dorms. When Shalit was at Williams College, which does not have a religious tradition as far as I know is, and is incredibly uh, liberal, both um, politically and socially, co -ed, all the dorms were co-ed, and shockingly, the bathrooms were co-ed as well. Um, when I went to college uh, in 1983, back in the Stone Ages, um, co-ed dorms had just become I think finally accepted. When they first came out, it was, it was a pretty shocking thing because it used to be that if young men wanted to visit girls, they would have to go to the dorm um, within certain hours, sign in, and in a lot of cases, they weren't even allowed up to the girls' rooms. Um, they would have to sit in a lounge, they would go out on a date, but they weren't allowed up where the girls lived. Um, there were no co-ed bathrooms when I was in college, and I'm sorry, but I just cannot imagine living like that. And I know that younger people are much more laid back about particulars like that. For example, you know, you look at apartments that people have in college or in graduate school, and you think, oh my gosh, you know, I could never, every, you know, people sleep on the floors, you know, it's just so, it's just so casual, I could never do that. But uh, Shalit posits that, um, young men and young women sharing bathrooms, uh, sharing dorm floors, 
means that there is no more mystery between the sexes. And mystery, in some cases, is a good thing. She's saying that if you're about to go on a date with, oh, thank you very much for my doll. <laughs> you know, I thought, I'll just keep this and I'll give it to Toys R Us, at, or not Toys R Us, Toys for Tots at Christmas, but I'm gonna take it back to the store. I don't wanna, re <laughs> I don't wanna release that into the universe, I'm sorry. Um, she's saying that sharing dorms is it, it's leading to a decline in mystery between the sexes, and that's leading to a decline in respect. If you're about to go on a date with a woman, and you're brushing your teeth, and she's shaving her legs at the sink next to you, you know, you're not about to be on your best behavior on the date. Um, as I recall, when I was in the co-ed dorm, and again, there were no there were no bathrooms. I think there were there was a lot of good to it because I and I think taking away some of that mystery was a good thing because I think the boys and the girls or young men young women who were living in the dorms they learned to be friends with each other. Um, it it was very relaxed. You saw each other in your bathrobes. The boys saw the girls without makeup, and I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I just think it showed them that everyone's a human being. Um, everyone has their downtime. Um, there really, there really shouldn't be a lot of mystery about the opposite sex. Of course, uh, there's the issue about does a co-ed dorm make it easier for the students to engage in hanky panky, as previous uh, generations might have said? Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. Um, some uh, colleges now. I have a friend whose daughter is going away to school in September. Some colleges are having co-ed rooms now. Um, ostensibly for older students who are in a committed relationship and might want to live together in the dorm. Is dating dead? Um, co-ed dorms, early sexualization, is this leading to dating being dead? I think it is. Um, I, I'm going to show you a picture from Life Magazine. Best of life. This is a segment called Growing Up. This is a photo, teenagers at a 1947 Tulsa party munch donuts, sip coke, and dance as life said to dreamy tunes like night and day. Showing you pass that around. You know what, I'm sorry, but I think I would have loved that <laughs> in college. I really do. Um, I, there are very few instances that I can remember, and I checked around with my peers, and they said the same way. There were just very few times that a boy would call up a girl and say, would you like to go out to dinner in a movie? I will pick you up at 7 o'clock on Saturday. And it was expected that he would pay. That, that just doesn't happen anymore, except maybe for something like the prom. Um, what people usually do, because they are in the co-ed dorms, because things are so much more relaxed at the high school or elementary school level, um, what people who are at dating age do is sort of go around in large herds like wildlife. Um, they go from the dorm, they go in groups of 20 to the dining hall, they go in groups of 10 to happy hour, um, and everything is, uh, sort of done on this large scale. And within the group, what you have is the infamous hookup, um, a phrase that Tom Wolf, uh, if he did not invent it, certainly popularized it. This is simply where a young man, a young woman from the herd of livestock pair off, have sexual relationship with no further expectation of a relationship, a phone call, it's just being together sexually for the evening. Um, I'm sorry? Hooking up. Hooking up. So you'll um, have to tell children and grandchildren in your family that you know this phrase. Um, they'll think you're very cool. Um, and Shalit is saying that um, it may be easy, I think, for the men, but women are just simply not capable of engaging in that kind of behavior and then waking up the next morning and have it not bother them. Um, she is saying that sex, romance, love, and courtship are interpreted differently by men and women. And no feminist movement, no economic status, no college education or lack of college education is going to change that. That biologically, 
emotionally, spiritually, and hormonally, women are simply different from men. Now, when it came to um, the new lack of dating rules where people would just go out to happy hour, have seven beers, and then hook up, um, I think a lot of the guys were like, great, and I don't even have to call the next morning. Um, Shalit says that uh, there, there is a tradition called the um, morning after checkup call, which is where the only thing that's expected of the man at that point is to call around noon, uh, make sure the girl's okay, she got home, and that is really, that's really it. And Shalit is saying it's making a lot of women feel used, upset, dirty, but they feel uncomfortable sharing this with their friends because they assume that everyone else is having a great time. The sociologists have a great phrase with this, and I think I did write it down somewhere, uh, pluralistic ignorance, where um, you assume you're the only one who feels this way, that everyone else is with the program, um, you're the only one who has an issue. Um, I, I think I'm going to agree with Wendy Shalit on this one. Um, I can't, I don't really hear about a whole lot of happiness on the dating scene with young men and women. One of my big uh, critiques of this book is that she kind of makes the assumption that all men are in hound dog mode, particularly when they're 17 to 25. And I would certainly think that there are a lot of young men who would want romance, who would want relationship, and would want some commitment. Um, Another phrase that you're going to need to know in talking with younger generations now is the walk of shame. Uh, this is where the young woman goes home the following morning from the dorm or apartment of her hookup. And the mascara is kind of down to here. The hair is looking a little ratty from the night before, and she's wearing the same thing that she had on at 8 p.m. last night. Um, walking back through the campus in this condition uh, subjects her to hoots and cat calls from boys hanging out at their dorm. Um, another trend now that we have a lot uh, at the high school and college level is called friends with benefits. That is where the uh, boy and girl, man and woman, are simply friends. They hang out together, they go to class together, they study together, talk about whatever they want, but occasionally when one of them, usually the boy, has an urge, they have sex, but there is still no commitment to a relationship, um, FWB for short. Um, Seventeen Magazine will look at. As I recall, um, when you're in high school, at the age of 17 is when you stop reading Seventeen. By the time you hit college, you move on to Glamour, um, Cosmo, things like that. But Glamour and Cosmo, they've got you covered. They now have versions for uh, teen. They have teens. They have Teen Cosmo and Teen Vogue. And as I recall, in Seventeen, the big nirvana that you had to achieve was the prom. Everything was just leading up to the prom. The prom was just the whole goal of life. And the dresses, as I recall, were actually pretty modest. We had pale blue, we had pale pink, we had a lot of white. And now it looks like Oscar night. Um, there are also a lot of articles with birth, birth control information um, and advice on how not to be too clingy after the hookup. And keep in mind, this is aimed at 12 to 17-year-old girls. And I, I think when I was maybe that age, I would think, because I, I was very, very much into the feminist movement when I was in high school and college, and I would think that this is great, we're empowering women, um, knowledge is power, this is excellent. But as a mother and in middle age now, I'm looking at this and saying, we are giving out this information way too young. Uh, there's the old debate. If you talk to a young person and you give them information about birth control, are you giving them information to protect themselves or are you encouraging them to have sex? I can't solve that here standing at the podium. There are debates going on at the state and national level about should we have sex education in the schools or should we have abstinence programs in the school? Who's going to teach it? The parents, the gym teacher, the health teacher? Do we have doctors come in? Who's going to pay for this? Um, if I don't agree with it, um, are you going to use my tax dollars to teach this? So um, this discussion is just going to be going on forever and ever. We talked about the Girls Gone Wild videos. Um, there's a Nike ad that Cosmo and Vogue and also Teen Cosmo and Vogue had been running 
I'll read the copy to you. Uh, it's a two-page spread. It shows an exuberant young woman wearing a sports bra and pants, so that means her midriff is entirely bare, doing a very wide plie. Centered in the ad are these words, which are kind of set like a poem. There's a hot chick in the mirror. Her pelvic thrusts are the stuff of legend. Even her earrings have attitude. I can't believe that hot chick is me, but I give her a thumbs up. She gives me a sexy smile, and I'm flattered, but hey, I have a boyfriend. Just do it. That's the Nike slogan, and this is aimed at 12 to 17-year-old girls. Um, I remember when I was in high school, I used to read Cosmopolitan magazine, and I think at the age I was reading it, even 16 or 17, we read it because it was just so over the top that it was funny. It used to make my mom nuts when I read it. Why are you reading that? That stuff is garbage. And then as soon as I put it down and walked out of the room, she'd pick it up and read it. Um, <laughs> um, and I actually, I actually have read um, uh, some reports from editors who used to work at Cosmo. There were always confessionals by women and you know interesting little tricks they did with their dates. A lot of that stuff was just made up around the boardroom table. So they didn't do scientific surveys or a lot of man or woman on the street. It was just made up. Um, let's see. All right, we'll go on to close. Like I said, um, Older generations have been shocked about younger people's clothes forever. Um, from the higher hemlines in the 1920s to the braless look in the 70s, um, the mini skirts and micro minis in the 60s. Uh, I remember uh, in the 1980s when I was in school, the flash dance sweatshirt was really big. That's where you took any old sweatshirt. Um, it's from the movie Flash Dance. You cut the neck out. Um, and it would just sort of rest right at the edge of your shoulders. And you could wear it with jeans and sneakers for the casual look. Or if you were going out clubbing, you'd wear a mini skirt and high heels and just put it off the shoulder. And because you had all the shoulder bare, you wouldn't want to wear a bra to ruin the look. So you were braless for the evening. But of course, you were 19 years old and things were <laughs> kind of perky, so there wasn't really a problem. And yeah, the mothers hated that, and it was a trend, and it went out. But when we were wearing those, we were 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, we are looking at, uh, Shalit mentions in her, um, in her book about thongs being targeted at six to eight year olds because they have cartoon characters on them. I'm not going to be wearing a thong that has you know, Elmo on it or something, but there are thongs being made for girls with, young girls with cartoons on them. Um, I know uh, a lot of moms have been, in my club, we exchange emails a lot because we're looking for clothes that are going to cover our girls decently. Um, in the girls' departments at larger uh, department stores, uh, you're seeing low rider jeans that come below the hip bones. You're seeing belly shirts, which shows a little bit of the midriff. Now, if I were 22 years old and I had flat abs, I'd be wearing that stuff, let me tell you. But I just don't want a six-year-old girl to wear it. Um, I don't want a 42-year-old me <laughs> to wear it either. I think that would just frighten people too much. Um, so what are we going to do about all this? Shalit talks about um, how if women really want to be empowered, what they have to do is stand up and say, I am not comfortable with this. I'm sure that some women are, and that's fine. But as long as they're over 18 or 21, they're paying their own way, they realize what the consequences could be. That is one thing. But when we're targeting elementary school girls, even preschool age girls, and encouraging them to dress like this, something is wrong. And also, even high school or college age girls, if they really want to dress more modestly, if they want jeans that come up to the waist, if they want shirts that go down down below the waistline a little bit. Um, if they want V-necks but not V-necks, they should be able to find those things in the store and they should be able to wear them to school, wear them to class, wear them on a date and not feel like they're the only geek in town. Um, Nordstrom's department store, which is based in Seattle, all right, um, she, Shalit tells us about a 13-year-old girl who went shopping for some school clothes and simply couldn't find anything she felt comfortable wearing. Not so much that she wasn't comfortable with this year's colors or this year's collars, 
she said she was embarrassed when she put some of the clothes on. So what she did was write a letter to the board of Nordstrom's who said, um, you know, you're the ones who put the clothes out there. People have to wear what they can find. And there are a lot of young girls who are uncomfortable. Well, she figured that would be the last that would be the end of it. She wouldn't hear anything. They actually contacted her, and it became national news. And the people were telling her, you know, uh, you young people set the trends. We just follow you. And she said, no, you put the clothes out. We wear what we can find. So it, the second half of this book, um, or the first half, taught, she has a lot of examples about um, the difficulties we're having in society right now. Letting our children be innocent for a few years, um, having decent clothes in stores that young women uh, and girls can feel comfortable buying. And the second half, she talks about um, efforts that people are making to kind of rein things back in a little bit. Shalit is saying the pendulum always swings um, in terms of social mores, in terms of fashions. As we recall, after World War II, things got uh, pretty conservative. Hemlines went way down. We had the new look with the cinched in waist, the turbo bosom and the big skirt. Um, we had people getting married at younger ages, larger families. Um, dad was back, dad was barbecuing in the backyard. And then things got more liberal and then they swung back. But she's saying that the pendulum has swung so far to the liberal side that it's gotten stuck in the branches and it's time to do something about it. Uh, the girl who wrote to Nordstrom's is an example. Uh, there's also a trend now um, called pure fashion shows that school groups, church groups, synagogue groups can put on where the girls can make their own clothes or buy what they do find that they like in the stores that makes them feel comfortable and modest. And they will have a fashion show at a school or the mall and the stores get credit. And that way the stores that are offering the more modest clothes get a lot of publicity. Um, the big problem that Shalit has in her first book and also Girls Gone Mild is the criticism she gets for people from people about her preference for modesty. And they tell her, you need to be comfortable with your body. Um, you don't, you know, it, it's, it's OK to like sex. And Shalit is saying, I am comfortable with my body. I am comfortable with sex. And that is why I want to keep it private. She said, there are simply some things for a lot of people that are best remain private. There are things that we only should be sharing with a few people. We don't need to show 100 people at a beer-soaked party in spring break our bare breasts. Um, that's maybe just for our long-term boyfriend, for our husband, for our doctor. And think about all the thousands and thousands of people who see that video. Um, are those women really empowered, she's saying? Are they empowered because they got drunk and went dancing? And the feminist leaders that she interviewed, including the president of NOW, said, well, it's great. I think, I think it means those girls feel comfortable with themselves. And Shalit's saying, they were pretty much railroaded into doing this. Um, can you imagine the regret a lot of them feel uh, weeks later after they've sobered up, they're home from spring break, and they realize that this video is out there? Um, so she's, she's really encouraging people to say that, um, um, you know, being comfortable with your body does not mean necessarily displaying it to everyone. Um, one, uh, one point that I'd like to make is I think we're in, um, we're in a trend now, as Shalit says, where things are very casual regarding, regarding sex and regarding relations with men and women. Um, marriage, long-term relationships, parenthood is kind of being disparaged. Uh, people are getting married later, having kids later, prolonging their youth as much as possible. But Think, uh, if, you, if you had to name the person in the last 100 years, the woman in the world who was the most fascinating for people, who got the most media coverage, who would you name? She's, um, I would, Princess Diana, perhaps? But look at all those women, Jackie Kennedy, um, Princess Diana. What are they known for, for marriage, for motherhood, um, for femininity, uh, for modesty, 
um, for volunteering, Princess Diana's cape for volunteering to help the sick and needy. I mean, if you have women who are that idolized, and certainly they were beautiful and they wouldn't have been in the paper as much if they weren't, but if um, there, there was some gut level appeal um, with, with the women that I think shows that um, there's, there's something in us that's longing for more, that's longing for something traditional. Um, after the sexual revolution came, a lot of the old rules about men and women's behavior, about dating, about marriage, about household chores were thrown out. And the problem is, is we're living in very interesting times right now. Those rules have been thrown out, but we're still in the process of making new ones. And no one really seems to know what they're supposed to do. Um, does the boy call? Uh, does the girl call? If they go out together to happy hour, who pays? Um, so it's, um, I have a feeling that in 100 years, sociologists are gonna look, at, uh, look back on these decades and say things were, um, things were really pretty interesting. Uh, she also talks about, um, how are we on time, Joe? Going on towards one. Um, the one thing I like about Shalit's book is, and the previous one, is that her tone is very sweet and reasonable. She's not beating anybody over the head verbally. Um, she's very encouraging. Uh, she laughs at herself a little bit when she relates what her critics have said about her. She doesn't preach. She doesn't rage. She doesn't sound like Dr. Laura. Um, she does, though, strongly applaud girls and women who are trying to take back the day, as it were, um, applaud their choices to be modest, and thinks that adults, that parents, should be parents and encourage this. Um, another one of her issues is she feels that baby boomer parents, um, the sex, love, and dope generation, is uh, behind this encouragement in uh, younger sexuality with children. Um, a quick question. Um, we are living in rapidly changing times. Um, do you think uh, the Bratz dolls, um, the Girls Gone Wild videos, do you think it's really this bad right now? I don't know. I'm, um, I'm not, you do, okay. Here, I passed one, I passed one around before you. That's, no, I you see say, one, you okay? that's what they had. And I turned to some young girls and I said, you know, do you like these? I mean, do you think this is a good thing for a child? And they said, no, no, wait and get a rain check for the, for the cabbage patch. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> All they had was brats at yeah. many of the big stores. Mm -hmm. I think, um, like, like the, um, a girl who, who wanted to lead uh, the boycott at uh, Nordstrom's. You know, people have to buy what they can find. And this stuff is out there. And there are a lot of people who get it off the shelf. They get the belly shirt or they get the brat stall. And that's sort of all that's there. And they have to wait for something else to come out. Um, as far as dating goes, um, the way things are uh, between, um, I keep veering back between the terms boys and girls and men and women. Uh, people often say college students are young adults. I think they're old children, uh, especially the 18 and 19 year olds. Um, as far as an, a, a new dating rule, what, what can we suggest to young people? Um, do the boys always have to do the calling? Or is it okay for a girl to call? And here's the big question. If they're both 17, they both have part-time jobs, who pays? The one who invites? Do they split the check? Um, it's all up in the air right now. What do you? Um, I, I think it's it's the media. It starts with the media mm -hmm. uh, and what sells. And um, the media has promoted um, shows, you know, that focus on women's bodies, women's beauty, focus on superficial stuff. And then the clothes need to be what's available in the stores mm -hmm. because then that's what the young people want. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it goes. You know, it goes back to, I mean, I'm sure it goes back beyond that, but it goes to the media, I think, and what sells mm -hmm. to begin with. And the other thing about the question about the, uh, the dating, um, there's that series, that very popular series of books called The Rules. Yes. That mm -hmm. um, really says, you know, I don't, you know, this isn't about feminism or, or bashing feminism, but there are certain basic um, 
there are certain basics to the male-female relationship that go back to the way it, the way it used to be, and those still need to be followed in mm -hmm. order for relationships to be successful. Yeah, I mean, everything everything is up in the air right now, and Shalit wonders, you know, are we um, in sharing bathrooms in? Uh, college dormitories and and not dating or in women taking the lead in romantic situations are we going against nature is that little voice that's telling women in the morning I feel so used I shouldn't have slept with him last night is that biology are we supposed to be protecting our precious egg you know we're the one with the precious egg do women feel like that because of biology is that, is that inner voice, is that just common sense or is it biology? I think it, everything is just up in the air right now and um, there's just so much discussion about this on so many different levels and you know, it's nothing that can be worked out in an afternoon. And as far as you say with, um, with the media, the advertising, the movies, the television shows, that's coming from Manhattan and Hollywood, which are the two most liberal spots in the United States. You know, what do people in Omaha, Nebraska think about this? What do people in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan think about this? I don't, I don't know. In Albany, New York, all I know is that I don't want my daughter watching Sex in the City. I don't want her watching Friends. Um, and there's another, there's a show on now called Two and a Half Men, about two single men, and they have a young boy, and they're living in a beach house in Malibu, of course. And I was flipping around the dial, and I just caught, I mean, it was just enough to see what was on and my kids were there. I think I was looking for the Weather Channel or maybe some news or something. And one of the characters said, um, and this is where we get to the R part, just, the, just enough where I got this line. Oh, you lucky son of a bitch, you're going to get laid tonight. And this was a rerun at 7.30 in the evening. And I'm thinking if that's what's considered normal, um, every once in a while standards and practices lets the people who um, do cable TV say a little bit more. Because you have to be able to compete with what's on HBO. People watch The Sopranos, people watch Sex and the City, and they're used to seeing a certain amount of flesh, they're used to hearing the S word and the F word. Well, little by little, standards and practices at the networks let people say, naughtier stuff. And one year we get ASS, and then the next year we get BITCH. So um, we're all just going to hell on a sled. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, one thing that I'd like, I'm sorry, Kathy. Um, when you were talking about Charles, just as a, an example of that, the girl who wrote into Nordstrom, a number of years ago, let's see, my daughter's a junior in college. This was when she was in high school. It was an ad by J.C. Penney. I don't know if anybody remembers this. <coughs> was it the TV ad? It was a TV ad where a girl was trying, a young girl, must have been about 12 or yeah. 13. Do you remember this? Yes. The mother, the girl is, is um, getting dressed, and she's wearing a T-shirt, or, or she's putting on the jeans mm -hmm. or something. The mother comes in, and the mother is not me. She's not a baby boomer. She's the... Um, she's really your generation. Probably, probably Gen <laughs> yeah. X, like early. She's a Gen X, and she comes in and <clears throat> modernizes this little girl. Mm -hmm. You remember this, Anne? Yes. And they ran this for a while, and t I called in. I called in. I called the company, and I Good said, I, I canceled my J.C. Penney uh, charge card. <coughs> oh, and... Um, she she grabbed it. Mother came in. This was not even a criticism. This was encouragement. What she did. Oh, what she did. What she did is, I'm sorry. Um, she lowered the girl's jeans. She grabbed the hips and kind of scooched right, them down a little bit. And so the belly button was showing. She um, tied the t-shirt. Tied the t-shirt so the so the belly showed. Right. She what she did is she made this child. She made this child. Um, Seductive in right. her seductive outfit became right. seductive, yeah. and that's how she says, and that's how you go to school. And this is what she said. She says you want to look like the other girl. It was something like that. Yeah, you want to look like the other girls, or you want. It was absolutely. I sat there. My husband. He says, "What is that?" <laughs> and Shalita saying, "My daughter saying, saw the yeah. ad. My daughter looked at me, and she says, 'What the?' She says, "Mom, 
that's black humor. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> and Shalita's it's saying normal. that. And um, I see Penny's reaction. Oh, they thought this was normal. I got some sort of, oh, well, that's what, you know, the, the justification was just unbelievable. But people <laughs> called in, started canceling their credit cards. I did that. I they ended letters. up calling me out. I called. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. um, and there were other people that did this and they canceled the ad. And nobody would say anything more. I tried looking it up on the internet mm. or anything. Nothing. Well, they they, they shut their mouths. Because I am convinced people who did this had no children. I think there are people yeah. in advertising who have no children. Their careers are it. And the women who do have children, who write, who encourage these ads, somebody else is taking care of their kids. I mm. absolutely believe this. Shalita is um, saying that the young the girls are embarrassed. Yeah. This was unbelievable. This was unbelievable. And these ads got canceled because, because then I began reading it on blogs. The ads mm -hmm. got canceled because of public outrage. Mm -hmm. And the public out and it wasn't just mothers. It was fathers who were writing in about this. On on male blogs, they were they couldn't <coughs> believe this. That this this was in by J C Penny. Yeah. And J C Penny is very you know, little Target America. does this a little now and then. If you look at the um, the inserts into the Times Union, if you just start comparing Coles mm -hmm. and Boscovs mm -hmm. and some of these ads, and see how the children, the girls, the boys are one thing, boys are, you know, but if it's, you watch how the girls are dressed and how they're positioned by the photographers. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not just catalog anymore. Yeah. It's something else. And then there are some that are very good and that, you know, they don't do that. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. you put children in a seductive pose. Oh, no, no, <coughs> you start on. them at three years old wearing bikinis and their, their bottoms hanging down and the mm -hmm. string. Yeah. Sorry. No, I also think a lot of the ads are very derogatory to the young boys too. I, I, <laughs> I am, and I need to preface this by saying that when I was in college in a very small down in Elmira, so not exactly a hot spot. My roommate was a professional model, so I, I looked at all this with a very different, I mean, she was also a straight A student and a phenomenally talented person, but anyway. Um, when I worked at the assembly, I was with the Ag Committee and got to go to a nutrition conference on Wolf Road, and the speaker was a young guy from, he was working now in Washington, D.C. He had worked in the media, I think he used to work with Peter Sellers, who's, I mean, not like a young hotshot, but he was just a very talented young guy was so disillusioned by what he saw going on in the media that he left. He was very upset about what was being put on and what was being intentionally kept off. So he left and created a media literacy course for, for any, he is now living down near Washington, D.C. So he brought this commercial that a friend of his had helped to shoot and it was kind of food related because of the audience he was talking to. <laughs> and it was, I don't know, Doritos or Fritos or some fried snack and they didn't identify the campus, but it was clearly an Ivy League. I mean, gorgeous buildings and Ivy colored and not state U kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this this hot, sexy little young co-ed kind of sauntering through the college library. But it also showed the guys totally drooling over her, making fools of themselves, which I didn't think was <coughs> all that typical either, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but part of why he was talking about this commercial, she had a midriff um, sweater. Uh, and they shot her from the front, not from the side. But he said his friend was telling him that they had to lengthen the sweater a little bit. And he said, I'll tell you why in a minute. And I looked over and said, you know, lipo suction. And he said, no. She, and this was where the part of my, my roommate came in, um, and, and this was not any famous model. This was like a no name that nobody would have ever recognized. And she literally had had surgery done. And she had had, in order to flatten her stomach, had had her two bottom most ribs broken. And then when they do that, I mean, you know, she was like 19, she was totally maiming her body. They, they do incisions in the side and then they pull the ribs out that way. And when I, yeah, yeah. And, and where I flashed back to my college roommate, well, and that was, you know, she kind of blossomed late in life. She didn't really understand why she was getting all the attention and it wasn't what her life was about anyway, by any means. But she did do a little bit. and. The way she would flatten her stomach would be to be on the floor in her little dorm room every night doing 100 sit ups. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, this is just. Yeah. I mean, it it's like athletes used to, one. they used wow. to win races by training, right. and now they win them by taking steroids. So it's, um, 
I know. That's, uh, the thing that makes me really sad is that there are young girls that are looking at these models and just thinking, you know, I don't look like that. No one's ever going to want to go out with me. I, my body looks terrible. That's, you know, that's what makes me really sad. Family hour used to be 8 to 9, it was 8 to 9 p.m. And anything, like the police shows and stuff, that came on at 9 or 10 o'clock. Um, I, I don't know if it um, stopped a particular year as much as it has been a phasing out. Um, networks like ABC, CBS, NBC, they have to compete with HBO and Showtime now. So um, they have to make everything hotter, louder, sexier, filthier. It is. It is. Dating is another problem that you mentioned. Um, my daughter has always said to me, why don't these boys, boys, she never calls them men, <laughs> and she goes to a school where it's 70% men, mm -hmm. um, and the girls themselves, the girls have become close, but then you have that competitive things about there are popular girls there, and then there are the unpopular, well, not unpopular, but the rest of the girls. And she says, boys don't know how to date. They don't. They don't know how to ask you for a date. She's, and, and we had this talk, and I had a suspicion as to why this happened. Why boys forgot how to ask a girl out, even to say, I mean, she's had some dates, mm -hmm. but she's had to go on J-date for that, because these guys are older. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I think it's because of who their mothers are. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, the mothers are younger than you, and they've never had dates, and they're, they want their boys to be as equal as the girls. The mothers have all this, you know, I want equality. It's mm -hmm. an interesting kind of, and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, they don't teach them how to date. They, they, they don't, don't teach them respect for women. They don't. Which is very interesting, and that, that's that Gen X, that generation after me and then even the one that are coming the ones that are coming up she says the mothers are as competitive with the girls mm -hmm. as and and so the boys the, the lines are not drawn for respect yeah. right for um, you know I I, I want to get to know you mm -hmm. nobody ever says I want to get to know you no and no, it's, it's, it's they want to have dessert. Everyone wants dessert first, yeah. or at least the boys want dessert yeah. first. Now, oh. there's no, there is no court. There's no courtship. There's courtship no, is dead in, in this. My country. daughter has says there's no chivalry. She's there's no doing a lot of reading about chivalry the last <laughs> couple of years. She says there is none. It's a mother's fault. Mother's fault. It's a mother's fault. I grew up the youngest of five girls, and I'm the only one in my family that's a baby boomer. I had one sister. When she was young, my parents absolutely, she was a rebel. I mean, she, she ran away. She, uh, um, she, took my, she took cats and swung them around by their tails. She shaved her doll's hair off. She took my cousin's T-bird and drove around the block. <laughs> this girl, she hung out at a place called the Greeks and smoked a cigarette. This was scandalous. But you know, she married a man of our religion, and she's religious to this day. Yeah. I, I, agree, I agree that there are a lot of parents who are just not setting any rules, setting any standards. And as far as the procedure about dating or courtship, there's just no procedure anymore. They don't know what to say. One concern I have as a mother of a daughter is, I like the idea of a boy calling and saying, I'd like to get to know you. Would you like to go out for coffee? But I also don't want my daughter to sit around and wait for someone to call her. Um, that always, it always puts the, the ball in the man's court. And I don't want her to be in high school or college and saying, nobody ever calls me. You know, I, I want to go out, I want to go to a party, I want to go to the prom, but um, I am not allowed to pick up the phone and call someone. So there needs to be some kind of courtship, but women have to have a little more power too. Um, and Shalit is just saying, every, you know, in the interest of empowerment, everything just got thrown out. And we're all just sleeping together because we don't know what else to do. I'd love to know how she met the husband. Uh, I, um, I don't know how she met him. I don't know how she met him, but I know that they followed really strict um, Orthodox Jewish customs that they, until they were married 
engaged or married, they did not touch each other. No handshakes, no hugs, no kisses. They did not touch each other until they were committed for marriage. And she talks about in her first book um, about having an aunt and uncle who showed her photos of relatives who were following those rules. And they did not touch until they were engaged. And the woman wore a wig or a hat after she got married. And she said, you know, that's a little extreme too, but God, at least there's rules. At least there's some respect there, you know? Um, and she actually said she got a little, you know, she got a little verklempt because she was very touched. <laughs> She's in her early 30s right now. And um, her husband is Canadian. That's why they live in Toronto. Um, another example about a boycott, actually the young ladies who arranged this um, called it a girl cot. Abercrombie & Fitch is an enormously popular store with um, young people right now. Didn't it used to be kind of like a high-end L.L. Bean um, sailing and camping equipment? Um, there's a funny story about William F. Buckley short, uh, about, you know, before he passed about 10 years ago. He went into Abercrombie & Fitch expecting to get a weather vane and was handed a catalog, which he said bordered on the pornographic. Well, they had, um, so imagine his surprise. They had t-shirts that Abercrombie & Fitch was selling that said, uh, for the girls, it said, let's see, um, who needs brains when you have these? Um, what was the other one? Um, Blondes are adored, brunettes are ignored, things in this vein. The boys t-shirt says, plays well with D cups. Um, so some girls got together and staged a girl cot and they wrote to Abercrombie and Fitch and they said, people love your clothes. People buy your clothes because it's the thing to have. And you should, they basically came out and said, you should know better than this. Girls are embarrassed to wear these shirts. Um, and they took the shirts off the market. So. Empowering yourself maybe means not taking your clothes off, but writing a company that is making you unhappy and saying, I'm canceling my credit card. I'm not taking my kids to back to school shopping at your store. Um, one thing I would like to share with you, um, it's a story I've always remembered. A few years ago on PBS, they had a documentary about Nazi art. And I wish that I had taped it because it was fascinating. Um, the Nazis got rid of all the degenerate art by Jewish artists and by Impressionists and by uh, modernists and people like Picasso and decided they were going to do their own art. And a lot of this glorified the male and female ideal Aryan form. They had a lot of nude painting. They had a lot of nude sculpture. Um, this art hasn't survived the test of time. You show it to people now, and it doesn't work because, first of all, the artistic technique is simply not there. And the other reason it doesn't work is it seems to be lacking in humanity. Um, I think if you go to a museum and you see a famous nude sculpture or painting, there's something about it. If you see people watching nude, if they almost look their eyes get a little wider, their faces open up a little bit, and there's something very healthy and beautiful about that sculpture. It almost makes you want to get nude too because it celebrates the human form. It celebrates what a beautiful creation the male and female body can be. And they interviewed a British art critic who was looking at the Nazi art, and he was very plain spoken, and he said, any wanker can draw a picture of a guy with a surfboard in the nude. But it takes an artist to lend that nudity some humanity, some respect, and the spark of life. And that Nazi art didn't have that. And to kind of translate to what Shalit's book is doing, is she's saying the sexuality, the nudity we have today, it doesn't have humanity and it doesn't have respect. We need to bring that back to the sexual relationships. We need to make the body not something to showcase. That doesn't mean we're not, it doesn't mean we're prudes. It doesn't mean we have hang-ups about nudity. It doesn't mean we have hang-ups about sex. It just means we want to save it for the one we love. So there you go. Um, that's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> excellent job, Lisa. And I got through without saying any, any Good, words. Man, we, we, may just, we may do a little editing. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much.